Hi everybody, Happy New Year. I'm Matthew Leonard, Executive Director of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And once again, I am joined by my good buddy, Mike Aquilina, Fathers of the Church expert and the author of more books than Mr. T has gold chains. <laughs> now, I drug Mike back in here today because we're gonna talk about two of the three Cappadocian Fathers, uh, St. Basil the Great and also St. Gregory of Nazianzus. But speaking of those books, I wanna tell you first of all about his latest, which is really, really good. Yours is the Church. How Catholicism Shapes Our World. I'm about a third of the way through, Mike. I love it. Great job. Glad you like it. So we're going to talk about uh, these Cappadocian fathers. And that, that title always makes me a little thirsty for a double shot espresso. <laughs> but these guys weren't Italian. Uh, they weren't hanging out at Italian cafes. So who were they? And let's start with St. Basil. Well, uh, Cappadocia is the, uh, the part of... E it's, today it's Eastern Turkey. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the part of Asia Minor. Uh, where they lived, and they lived in the fourth century. The Cappadocian fathers were uh, were bishops in that area in in that time. We're talking about the second half of the fourth century. Okay, now people have been paying attention to uh, like you guys, the, the St. Paul Center YouTube channel. Have been seeing a lot of uh, fathers of the church videos. What is it that makes Basil unique? How is there something that, that helps him? He stands out uh, in relationship to those who preceded him. Man, he was just an amazing man. He was uh, creative. He was uh, he had a lot of different g gifts because he was not only a gifted theologian, he was also a gifted administrator, and he was um, he was pretty good at at um, at at at, uh, at 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 putting his resources to uh, to good use uh, in the church. Um, what sets him apart? <laughs> it's hard to know where to begin. He's not called Basil the Great for nothing, exactly, okay? Yeah. Because of the greatness of his life. And you know, the guy was the same age I am now when he died. He was 49 years old when he died. So he accomplished all of this before his 50th birthday. He, he managed to write some of the most influential uh, theological works, preached a lot of the most influential homilies, uh, really solidified... Uh, the, the case for, for Nicene Orthodoxy in the church, and he managed to, to strategically name brilliant bishops uh, to support him in a lot of his, um, his work for the church. On top of all that, he was really the figure in history who established uh, a model for institutional charities in the church. I mean, today we have Catholic charities, we have Catholic relief services, we have all of these great Catholic institutions that do charitable work. And we think, oh, this is just part of the package of being religious. Well, it's not. It's not. This whole idea of institutionalized charity is a Christian notion. And not only that, it found its, um, its institutional form only when Christianity became a legal entity in the Roman Empire. And it was really Basil the Great um, who gave it that form. And, uh, and he donated some land uh, in, in his see in Caesarea for that purpose. And on that land they had, uh, they had poor houses, they had soup kitchens, they had hostels for travelers, they had hospices for the dying, and they had hospitals. Now you have to understand that these institutions didn't just spring up in, in the ordinary city. There, there, there weren't a lot of people who were looking to do work for the good of other people. That's not your standard pagan notion. It was something that, that, uh, that dawned on people with Christianity, with the dawn of Christianity. Well, Basil set up these institutions. They were staffed by his ascetics, his monks, and, and the, the, um, the campus became so vast that the locals called it the New City. It was like a second city there in Caesarea. And when Basil died, uh, and his friend uh, Gregory Nazianzen uh, preached his funeral oration, he said that this new city was like the eighth wonder of the world. That's how vast it was. That's how great it was. That's the kind of work it was doing. What kind of an impact did that have? I mean, people must have noticed this. So the yeah. pagans must have said, well, look at what these Christians are doing. What, I mean... No one was looking to the state, or were they looking to the state at that point in time for uh, these kinds of charitable institutions? Did the church just fill a need that wasn't there through Basil, or what was the situation at the I'd time? say yes. The church filled a definite human need that was lacking in the world at that time. In the pagan world, you had philanthropy. You had philanthropic activity that was taken on sometimes by the state and sometimes by very wealthy individuals. 
Uh, the Colosseum in Rome is an example of that kind of philanthropy. A vast undertaking and this, this public work uh, that was devoted to the entertainment of the people of the city. So what were the motives then of those people who were giving that much money away? Look at the Colosseum and right. you see the motive. There's the name of the donor gotcha. in letters as tall as you and me. Wow. Okay? Same thing with the Pantheon, this this big temple that's in Rome. It was there as a as 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 a philanthropic project, you know, but the donor's name is glorified. The donor's name is glorified. In Christianity, this is done for the glory of God and for the good of others. And St. Basil, he, he had these, um, these ascetics, this army of ascetic, ascetics in his city, and he reformed monastic life so that they had a solid foundation of prayer that was uh, kind of the, um, the generator of their activity. Uh, but they also had to work, and he said that their work should produce something for the needy in the city. So if they were going to apply themselves to activity, it was to be for the good of others. They were to pour their lives out just like Jesus poured out his life. So he reformed the liturgy, he reformed monastic life, he, um, and he, he reformed this, this very idea of philanthropy. No longer was it done for the glory of individual rich people. Now it was done for the glory of God, for the good of others. And he managed to turn the, the, the church in his city into this organism devoted to those, to those ends. So he, um, he, we have his letters that he wrote to donors. Uh, trying to get them to pour their money into this so that they can take this this path they could take this as their path to heaven this is the way that they would they would go to salvation so they could present themselves to God on judgment day and say look I was part of the great mission of the church just like those ascetics were they served God in their way and I did in my way Basil had the church operating like a, a well-oiled machine, and, and even more than that, like a living organism, a living body, the living body of Christ in Caesarea, in Asia Minor, and it was a vital body, it was a strong body. So apparently somebody raised this boy right, you know? <laughs> and I don't want to step on the toes of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, but Basil came from a pretty holy family himself. He did. Know? He did, and uh, he, he, could, he, could, he could count, you know, if he did his genealogy, he could point to martyrs and confessors, Christian martyrs and confessors among his ancestors. Both of his parents were very devout. They were both very well off, too. They were a prominent family in the area. Uh, his father was a professor of rhetoric, and Basil was, was homeschooled as a young boy and into, into, um, into his adolescence. And then his father died. Now he was one of uh, Basil was one of nine children, nine children, and uh, where did he fall in line? Uh, he was he was the oldest. He was the oldest. Yeah, yeah. and he was named after his daddy, and um, and what's interesting is um, is uh, is that uh, you know if you look at that just that household there, we have five canonized saints in that household, three bishops in that household, so it's pretty remarkable. It was a <laughs> remarkable family he came from. That's almost um, not fair. <laughs> what about his sister? She's of no, right? Uh, well, yeah, St. Macrina. St. Right. Macrina the Younger, and she really is Macrina the Great. And she becomes a major figure in church history in her own right because of what she did to lead a monastic community. All right, you talked about all the different things that he did. And of the Cappadocian Fathers, he's known as the Man of Action. Mm. So... Uh, he, that meant he had to have some special gifts. Yeah. He had some ambitions. Yeah. Uh, anything beyond what it is you already described to us. Well, he also had great training. Uh, when he was young, uh, he was trained by his father, who was a, a prodigy himself. So he was raised by his father, who was a professor. Uh, and then he was educated in Cappadocia. He was educated in Constantinople under the great Libanius, who was the most famous rhetorician of his age. Uh, he was a pagan, he, and, and Basil kept on good terms with him all his life. Uh, and then he was educated in Athens as kind of the crowning touch. So we're talking an Ivy League education mm. he received. After that, he returned home to Cappadocia, and he had kind of a spiritual awakening. And he decided to devote his life uh, to Christ. He decided to live a life of asceticism. And so he wanted to do it right. And so what he did at that time was he made a tour of all of the great uh, places that were known for monastic life. 
and the life of the hermits. So he went to Egypt, he went to Syria, he went to Palestine, he went to Mesopotamia, and he did intensive studies of the way the monks lived in those places, the way the ascetics lived, and he kind of assimilated all of that, and then he synthesized it into his own rule, and he created a, a, a community back home. So it was like he was taking the best from all of these different varieties of monasticism and taking it all, assimilating it, and enculturating it back in Cappadocia. Was it his intent to start a monastery, or was he kind of doing that for himself and people would just kind of flock to him because of his holiness? Well, I think, I think it was his intent to have a community there because he was going to live with his mother, and his sister. So it was already a mixed gotcha. community, kind yeah. of unusual, but soon they drew friends, you know, and, and soon they were joined by joined by St. Gregory of Nazianzus, you know, to, to mention his most prominent friend, and it became uh, a center of monasticism. It drew pilgrims from all over the place who wanted, wanted a, a piece of this action. <laughs> all right, so we talked a few weeks ago about Ambrose, and yeah. if you haven't seen that video, you can find it on the St. Paul Center YouTube channel. But uh, one of the things we talked about with regard to Ambrose was that he did not kowtow to the state. That's right. Basil and Ambrose were contemporaries, mm -hmm. were they not? They Born were. just you know, a year or two or whatever apart. Mm -hmm. What was Basil's relationship with the state, especially given the fact that he had all of these charitable institutions and things that, that he was uh, undertaking? Well, he lived, he lived the Chinese curse. He lived in interesting times. Remember, Christianity had been legal for about a generation at this point. So it wasn't exactly secure. You can't say the church felt secure. And, uh, and sure enough, uh, in, in Basil's own lifetime, one of his classmates from Athens, Julian, uh, be became known as Julian the Apostate, right. the ex-Christian, who, who became emperor and then started to, uh, to try to marginalize Christianity. So, so he wanted Basil to be part of his project and invited him to be part of, um, part of his imperial court. Basil refused. Okay, so already you have this, uh, this, uh, this image of the very independent man that he was. Well, Julian had a mercifully short reign, uh, but then uh, the empire went back to kind of business as, as usual, which was dominated by emperors who were sympathetic to the Arian heresy. Mm. And a lot of the, uh, the lower level officials were as well. They put a lot of pressure on Basil to come over to their side, but he was adamant about his Nicene Orthodoxy. And so, uh, so, so he was a problem for them because he was so brilliant, he was so effective, he was so influential, and he was so against their project. So you, you have this, this, uh, this friction between them. And uh, his governor there in, in, uh, in Caesarea was a man named Modestus. He tried to put pressure on him and uh, was finally exasperated because, because he, was, he tried, he tried more or less bribing Basil, and Basil refused the bribes, and then he tried threatening him, you know, with punishments, and he said, I'll exile you, and Basil said, you know, I'm a pilgrim wherever I go on this earth, and God owns everything, so I'm just as much at home in any, any place you exile me to as I'll, I'll be here in Cappadocia. So he couldn't be threatened, he couldn't be, uh, he couldn't be uh, bribed, and this, this frustrated Modestus, who was used to getting his way with people. <laughs> but Basil lived such detachment because of his monastic formation, I would say, because of his, his, his formation in a strong Christian family as well. He lived such detachment that he kept refusing Modestus. And Modestus said to him, I have never encountered this attitude from anyone else. And Basil replied to him, well, maybe you've never met a Catholic bishop. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. My great stuff, as usual. Thanks for having me, Matthew. It's my pleasure. And if you're looking for some more great stuff, please visit us at SalvationHistory.com and like us on Facebook. God bless you guys.